perspective. It changes everything. It affects how we see the world around us, how we see ourselves and others. It informs our actions and our decisions. And ultimately, it defines our reality. For some people, their perspective is shaped by their own experiences, their history. Yet for others, it's their beliefs, what they consider to be right, that influences how they see the world around them. What's fascinating about perspective is that everyone has one and they're all different. When it comes to thinking about God, it's no different. The range of perspectives is very diverse. But if you listen closely to people's thoughts and views on God, what you most commonly find is that the majority place themselves, not God, at the center of the story. And by doing so, what they're really saying is, God and the universe revolve around me. Here's the deal. If we agree that God created the universe and everything in it, wouldn't it make more sense to try and seek His perspective? To better understand His point of view? God gives us His perspective in the pages of Scripture. And in it, we find that His story is the bigger story of the universe, the bigger picture, the great story in which all other stories play a smaller role in. God is on a rescue mission, a redemption operation that spans the globe and history. And He's not just redeeming mankind, but all of creation. And He is doing this through Jesus. Salvation in Jesus is our invitation into the greater story. A story where He forgives and transforms, and not only changes us to be more like Him, but then sends us out to point people back to Him. We join Him, His will, His purposes, His story, not the other way around. All right, well, if you haven't been with us recently, we've been in this series called Kingdom Come, and um, I want to just take just a moment and say thank you to Pastor Rick Hudgens and Ed Spencer, who have shared the last two Sundays and spoke, and uh, they were just a tremendous uh, encouragement to me, and I hope they were to you guys as well. And uh, at the center of this Kingdom Come series is this what-if question that we've been talking about, and this question has massive consequences for you and for me, um, for how we live our lives and for how we experience our lives as well. And here's the question. What if there is more to your life, more to the story of your life than just your life? What if there is more to the story of your life than just your life? Well, I believe the overwhelming testimony of Scripture is saying exactly that. And um, there's this bigger story that we all live within, a bigger story that is every bit as real as your struggles, as your pain, as your problems, as your joys, as just as real as all of those things. That there's this bigger story also where all of these pains and joys find their meaning and they find their purpose. The tragedy is that many people have no idea that their life and their story is part of this bigger story. And they never know how much their life matters to the story. And so how about you? How about you? Do you know that your story is part of a bigger story? And because of that, your life matters more than you and I can even know. The overwhelmingly clear message of the Bible is that there is a bigger story to your life and to my life, and that it, that story points to something that we call the kingdom of God. Now, this, this bigger story of God's kingdom is massively important for us because it gives us context and meaning for everything that we experience in our lives. So just like the video that we just watched, it, it watched, I asked that we could watch it again because it, it takes us back and it explains this kingdom perspective.
through which we can view our world and our lives. And as long as you and I know the bigger story to our lives, then we can understand our purpose. We can understand our role to play. We can understand and withstand just about anything that comes our way when we know the bigger story. It also gives context and meaning to everything that we read in the Bible, which is really helpful. Um, If you take the entire Bible, all 66 books, and you condense it down into one sentence, it would say something like this. What was created beautiful and good by God was broken by sin and is now being recreated, restored, and made new. This story begins with creation in the first book of the Bible in Genesis, and it ends with a vision of recreation in the last book of the Bible in Revelation with a new heaven and a new earth. This is, all, this is where we all come from, and this is where we're all going. But between back there and over there, we're all living in this messy middle <laughs> And it is messy, isn't it? Every verse of scripture has to be interpreted in light of this bigger story and this bigger context. Every event of your life and my life needs to be interpreted in light of this bigger story and context. It's our starting point. Otherwise, all of our interpretations go off the rails. So today, as we continue in this series, we're going to look at a couple of conversations that Jesus had with two different people, and we're going to see how this bigger story of Scripture impacts both people, which I hope will help us all see how this bigger story impacts us as well. But before we look at these two conversations, we have to set all of this up by going back to the beginning of the bigger story, back to creation, that first book of the Bible in Genesis. We have to go back there. And I shared this with you a couple of weeks ago where the story of the Bible is like one long act, three act play. You know, the the major plays that they do in the theaters, there's usually act one, act two, and act three. And you can do that with scripture as well. And so the story of the Bible is like a long three act play. And in act one, God creates the universe and he creates life and everything in it. And it's beautiful, it's perfect. And God calls it good. And then God makes it clear, though, to those first created people, Adam and Eve in the, in the Garden of Eden, that as long as they trust him and follow him, they will enjoy, enjoy this paradise that he's created for them. And they'll have a purpose. They'll have a role to play. He even gave them a job, something to do. And so in Act 1, we see this principle that trusting and obeying God equals life. But God also warns them that if they don't trust him and obey him, that it would only bring death and destruction and decay for them. Now, why is that? Why why did God say that? Well, think about it. God is the author and creator of life. He created it and he alone gives it. And so this bigger story takes a turn in act two. Most of you know the story. We see the devil himself deceiving Adam and Eve into trusting themselves instead of trusting God and obeying him. And so Adam and Eve made this devastating choice to trust in themselves and in the words of the devil instead of God. Direct disobedience to what God said. So, but what's key here is that before they ever committed the act of sin, they had already decided to trust in themselves rather than God. The sin worked from inside out. And what followed was exactly what God, what God said would happen, right? Adam and Eve, they're banished out of the Garden of Eden. They're, they're banished from God's presence, the author of life, the bringer of life. And it brings death to the whole human race, to all of creation. And so what was true for them 
has become true for all of us here today too, that when we separate ourselves from the giver of life, death and destruction is the result. Much like if you took a rose and you cut a rose off of a rose bush, that rose is just going to shrivel up and dry up and die. The principle in Act 2 is not trusting and obeying God equals death and decay and destruction. Now, what about Act 3? What about the third act? Well, you and I are living out Act 3. That's where we are right now. We're living out Act 3 of this bigger story. Now, remember that Bible in one sentence? What was created beautiful and good by God? Act 1. And then broken by sin, Act 2, is now being recreated, restored, and made new. Act 3 right now. This is where we find ourselves. And Act 3 began when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Can you believe we're only a couple months out from Christmas? This is the great Christmas event, right? When the eternal almighty God miraculously becomes one of us somehow, it's a miracle, (laughs) to show us what God is like. And so in human form, his name was Jesus, but his eternal name was something different. According to the Gospel of John, he was called the Word or God's Son. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 1, or you can follow along on the screen with us. Uh, But while we read this passage in John, think about how it relates. As we read it, think about how it relates to what we just talked about in Genesis the creation story there. And in John chapter one, it starts in the beginning. What else just started as in the beginning? Genesis, right? That creation account in Genesis, this is John's creation account here. And he's very intentional in calling us back there. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And through him, all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. And he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. He, yet to all that received him, who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The word, God the Son, the eternal God the Son, became flesh became one of us and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. Where did he come from? From the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. So the Word became flesh. God became a human and his name was Jesus and that kicks off Act 3 of this bigger story. But I want us to notice two things that John said defines Jesus, God's Son. Those two things are grace and truth. Jesus, God's Son, the eternal Word and God in human form, was full of grace and truth. He came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, what what does it mean for Jesus and therefore God to be full of grace and truth? And why does that matter to you and to me? 
Well, that's what we're going to try to dig into today. And I think the first thing we have to do is to define what grace and truth are. And so I'll attempt to do that. And, and uh, the first grace, first of all, there's two words that kind of define what grace is. One is gift. And I think the other one is undeserved. These two words define what the Bible says about grace. Grace is this gift that is given and received, right? Grace cannot be earned. You can't earn grace because when you earn something, that's not a gift, right? That's a wage. That's an earning. You deserve it because you earned it. You worked for it, but you cannot earn grace or work for it. You simply have to receive it. Otherwise, it's not grace. So grace is an undeserved gift given to an undeserving person. Truth. Now this comes from the Oxford Dictionary, just straight from them, and I thought it was a great place to start. But that which is true and in accordance with reality and fact So truth defines what is true and what is not true, right? What is real and what is not real. And so I think of truth as this, um, to think back to Genesis, I think it's like this echo of creation. It reminds us that, that there's a design, that there's a purpose to this world, that it was created for something. And scripture also teaches that God's words, his scripture are truth. You may remember Jesus's famous words, He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And so Jesus is saying, truth is not just what God says, but God is our standard for truth. I mean, which makes totally sense, makes total sense, right? Because God created what is true and what is real. You can't get any more real than than him. And so John says that Jesus came from God the Father and was full of grace and truth. Now, why does this matter? All of this is set up. It matters because you and I need grace and truth. We need grace and truth. In our lives, we need both. Neither one is enough on its own. We need grace and we need truth. All grace and no truth leads to chaos. It's chaotic. If we only give and give and give and no one gets what they deserve or or deserve what they get, it would only lead to chaos, right? Grace would be cheap. It would be taken advantage of. It would be taken for granted if all we had was grace and no truth. But all truth and no grace, that only leads to oppression. Because the truth is, none of us are perfect. None of us in the room, none of you that are watching, none of us are perfect. None of us are perfectly deserving. We all have our faults. We all have our failures. And more than that, you and I are not capable of living living up to truth's high standards. Not 100%. One way I like to think about this is grace and truth is kind of like flesh and bone, like in our bodies, right? We need both to function as a person. We need flesh and bone. So all grace and no truth is too squishy. It's too soft. It has no no form. There's no hard truth to act as a skeleton, to give it shape and to give it strength where it can stand up. And all truth and no grace is this bare scary thing called a skeleton. (laughs) No muscle, no skin, no hair, no eyes, none of that. Just bone. Maybe you've heard truth described like this too. That truth is like this, is like an incredibly sharp knife blade. Just reminds me, I actually have one today. Truth is like 
this knife. In the hands of a skilled and compassionate servant, surgeon, a sharp knife blade can be a scalpel, right? That, that cuts us in order to bring healing. But truth in the hands of someone with no grace and no love quickly becomes a weapon that slashes and brings harm. But Jesus, God in human form, he perfectly embodies grace and truth for us because we need both. And we're going to watch Jesus bring grace and truth to two different people in two different situations today. The first one is a famous confrontation that we've all heard about from John chapter 8. You can read, read along on the screen or, or read along in your Bibles. It says, at dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts. Now notice this was in the temple courts where everybody gathers, very public place, where all the people gathered around Jesus and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, caught in the act. Now, can you imagine the shame and the humiliation. They made her stand before the group. This is in the temple courts where everybody is. And said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, it commands us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap, John explains to us here, in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus. This humiliating scene, certainly one that is graceless. The Pharisees have their truth blades drawn and they're ready to slash. But Jesus bent down and he began to write something in the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and he asked her, woman, where are they? Where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she says. And Jesus says, then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now, let me ask you a question. How would this story go differently if Jesus had only exhibited truth? How does this play out if he only exhibits truth in this situation, in this story? Well, the truth is that the Pharisees were telling the truth of the law of Moses, right? That, that called for this woman's death. But the problem in this scenario is is the old say is the old theological saying it takes two to tango <laughs> right the law called for the stoning of the man and the woman involved in adultery and so if Jesus had only exhibited truth two people would have lost their lives that day with no chance of redemption no chance of restoration or forgiveness Jesus knew that both truth and grace were needed. Yes, the truth condemned this woman and this man, no doubt. Condemned them both. And you know what? It condemned the deceitful Pharisees too. And so truth would have called for a bloodbath that day. There would have been a lot of people feeling the impact of stones 
But Jesus knew grace was also needed, not just the truth, so that God's kingdom could come in that situation. Both were needed. Now, how did the kingdom come in this situation? How did that happen? Well, those condemning this woman were humbled and they were silenced with their truth blades in the face of grace, which is an incredibly hard lesson for them to learn. And the kingdom came in the life of this woman who receives a second chance, a new lease on life and truth that would set her free when Jesus says, now go and leave your life of sin. Now, how would this story play out if all that Jesus had exhibited was grace? Let's flip the coin a little bit. What if Jesus said, only exhibited grace? Well, those condemning would still have been silenced, right? They still would have been humbled. But the woman would not have heard Jesus' words of truth that would bring the freedom that she so desperately needed. Go and leave your life of sin. Stop what you're doing because it's only going to lead to death and destruction. Everyone in this story, Pharisees included, needed both grace and truth. And respectfully, so do you. And so do I. There's another conversation that Jesus had with uh, a a young man who had been doing really well for himself. Um, Many Bible translations call this guy a rich young ruler. He was ahead of the curve. He was on the move. He was an up and comer. He was above average. We pick up the story in Mark chapter 10. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. And he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, the young man said. All of these I have kept since I was a boy. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. Before he ever said a word, he loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. And at this, the man's face fell. And he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, he said, How hard it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were even more amazed at at him saying this, and they said to each other, Well, then who can even be saved? And Jesus looks at them and said, Well, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. See, this young man, he needed grace and truth as well, but in a different way than the young lady. You see, he had all the right answers. He knew the truth very well, but he had a grace problem. Because when Jesus asked him to sell all that he had to the poor, he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. And it was not just about the money. Deeper than that, he felt he deserved those riches 
that he had worked so hard for, that he had earned. And those poor people did nothing to deserve that money. They didn't earn it. They shouldn't get it. They had not worked for it. Jesus knew that he needed to learn the lesson of grace. And so he ends up teaching him a painful truth. That salvation cannot be earned. It's an undeserved gift given to an undeserving person. Something to be received gratefully. It's not earned pridefully. How would the story be different if Jesus had only exhibited grace to this young man? How would this be different if he had only exhibited truth? This young man, like like you and me, he needed both. He needed grace and truth. And so as we close out and try to figure out what takeaways we can take from these stories and what it means to serve a king who is full of grace and truth. Let me ask you, which person in these stories do you relate with the most? Do you you relate with the woman caught in adultery? You know you're living a lifestyle that is outside of God's will. You can't pray, God, your kingdom come and your will be done because you know you're living your own way for your will and your kingdom. But like the woman caught in adultery, you know that you're caught. And you need to know God's grace. You need to know that God loves you. You need to hear Jesus' voice like this woman did. You need to hear his words. Neither do I condemn you. But you also need to hear his words. Go and leave your life of sin. Go and live for your king. Give up this pointless search for meaning and purpose in things that don't satisfy and go live for your king. The king who loves you, who wants to provide for you. He wants to guide you and lead you into this bigger story. Maybe you relate more with the rich young ruler. You know the truth and you know all the right answers. You have the scriptures memorized and you know all the theology, but you also know that your heart has grown harder. And what you need today is grace. You need the truth of God's word to remind you that you're a sinner. A sinner only saved by grace not by your works, not by your spiritual performance. You may need a reminder that you are not good enough to earn God's love or to earn his salvation. None of us are. And you need this reminder from Ephesians 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. 
you realize he just included all of us in that. (laughs) But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. Even the faith that you have comes from God. Through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not saved by works so that no one can boast. We're reminded today that in this kingdom that we're talking about, that we're studying, the currency of this kingdom is grace and truth. You know, the currency of America is is a dollar, right? It's dollars. It's how we trade. It's how we do commerce. It's how we live. It's how we do what we need to do. The currency of the kingdom is grace and truth. And we need both. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we... um, We are grateful that you are full of grace and truth. Lord, I don't know what all pictures of God that we have in our minds in this room. But Lord, we just read, we just heard directly from your scripture that you came from the Father full of grace and truth. And so in the quietness of this moment, I just would encourage all of you to just take stock of your heart today. I've already told you that you need both. You need grace and you also need truth. But which one is the Lord talking to your heart about right now? Are you like the woman caught in adultery? Living a lifestyle that's only going to take you down a bad road. Living a lifestyle that's all about you and your thing and your agenda. Jesus says there's a better way than that. Leave that life of sin. Because we have a king to follow. Maybe you, maybe you relate more with the rich young ruler. Maybe you know that your heart has grown harder or, or your spirit is dry. And I encourage you to pray and ask the Lord to give you a fresh sense of his grace on your life. Lord, remind us that we could never earn your love, we could never earn your salvation. There's nothing that we could do to do that. We can't earn it. We can only receive it as a gift and trust you enough to receive that. And so, Lord, if there's anyone in this room that's never received you, that's never received and accepted your gift of salvation, I pray that this would be the moment right now where they say, yes, yes, God. I want to know what it is to receive your grace, to receive that gift of salvation and to live my life for you. I want to pray your kingdom come and your will be done in my life. I'm tired of chasing after the things that don't satisfy. I'm tired of chasing, trying to create meaning for myself and try to find purposes that I create. 
whenever you've got all of that has already been laid out for us. So Lord, in this moment, I just pray that we would listen to what you're saying to our hearts. Remind us, God, that we need your grace. Though we're undeserving, God, we want to receive it. We receive your love. We receive your favor. We receive who you are, that you love us and pursue us, even though we're undeserving. Help us to believe that today. And as we receive that gift, our hearts change. And it changes who we are. But Lord, many of us also need your truth today. Our culture needs to hear what is truth today. What is real and what is not real. What is true and what is not true. And so, Lord, we pray that your truth would stand. And, Lord, that we would be open to hearing your truth in our lives and our hearts. God, we love you. We thank you for this time together. I thank you for these beautiful people here. And, Lord, my prayer for them and for myself as we leave here is that we would leave as people who are pursuing your grace and your truth in our lives every day. We know as we do that, God, you meet us there. You meet us more than halfway. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your goodness to us and for the gifts of grace upon grace upon grace that you give us. Now, Lord, may we go and live for our King. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys for being here. We love you. Hope you have a great week. Mm -hmm.